Yes, uh, we had uh, the the best conference ever, the Crime Bait Conference, which is a it's it's in our region, but it's a nationwide conference of mystery writers and fans who come together here in Massachusetts for a weekend of absolute connections, of talks, of workshops, of pitching agents, all kinds of things. And we have quite a few attendees tonight. Clea was there, of course. Uh, Avram attended for his first time. And after Clea gets done, we'll ask Avram for his impressions of it. Uh, Mally uh, Baker also is here as well. And she was at the uh, conference. So we've got a number of people. Uh, Tina Belagrand, who you've all seen in some of these uh, episodes, uh, events was also there. So it was great meeting up with people uh, in real time instead of just seeing their Zoom heads. And uh, I am very pleased that we have a very distinguished uh, authoress, Clea Simon. And she is the author of a number of books, including psych psychological suspense novels, several different mystery series, nonfiction books. Her essays are included in multiple anthologies. Her short mysteries have been published in a number of publications. She's a contributor to the Boston Globe and her writing pops up in places like American Prospect, Ms., the San Francisco Chronicle and Salon.com. She gives a lot of readings and hosts events and which is something I did not know, she's an honors graduate of Harvard University. And what we do know is that she certainly loves cats. And Clea is gonna speak to us for a few minutes and when she's done, and we'd really like to open it up for questions and other people to start chiming in. Clea, please take it away. Thank you. And thank you for that lovely introduction, Dale. Um, uh, <laughs> college was a long time ago, but the cats are current. Though I have to say in my current book, they're, they're, the cats do not play a big part though. Um, careful and astute readers will notice that even though Hold Me Down, my new psychological suspense is very much not a cat cozy, a cat does make a small appearance. That was my my doff of the cap to the, my my cat readers. Um, but thank you again so much for that lovely uh, lovely introduction, um, and thank you Dale and Robert, both of you, for the invitation to speak today. And um, I yes, I do have a, a little bit of a talk. I'm going to talk about how I how I process this book, and then of course I will open it up to questions. But I'm hoping that some of the issues I bring up uh, will resonate with you, or, or maybe just make you think about your own writing. So here goes. Um, I told uh, Dale and, and Robert when I, um, when I first got this invite uh, that what I wanted to talk about was how the bright lights of fame, um, the bright lights of fame uh, cast very dark shadows, alluding to the setting of my new psychological suspense, which has held me down again. Uh -huh. uh, but what I'd really like to talk, uh, talk for a bit about those shadows and what purpose they served me as a writer. Uh, dissecting the process of writing, and I hope shedding light on how and why I set a mystery in the music world. Um, and, you know, I hope that this will raise, again, some general issues about writing that will resonate with you, um, and that uh, we can then talk about writing about uh, setting books in the music world or the arts world in general, or simply about writing mysteries. Now, uh, again, uh, Hold Me Down is set in the rock music world, and my protagonist, uh, Gal Raver is an older woman who decades before the action of the book was a rock star for a brief and shiny moment. She was also a heavy drinker and a little bit crazy for reasons that um, are made apparent in the course of the story. But when we first meet her at the opening of the book, she's back in town, which is Boston, my, my home base, to play a memorial for her drummer and best friend, Amy, uh, who's died of natural causes, having led a very different life than Gal did since leaving the band. But at the memorial, Gal sees someone who, well, ends up dead. And that murder is what sets up what is, after all, crime fiction. Uh, but in retrospect, it's really not the center of the story, but enough. So I was going to talk about fame and its dark side. So for starters, I'd like to explain a little about the rock music world, or clubland, as I think of it. This is also the setting for my 2017 psychological suspense, World Enough. And for me, it encompasses a whole range of places. That means the bars and the basement clubs, the stinky practice rooms. And if any of you have ever spent hours in a windowless basement cell trying to grind out something, you know what I mean. And the, the late night loadouts, everything, the decaying burlesque theaters that have been repurposed for rock bands. And also, yeah, the radio stations and the record store, and even the tour buses of what we used to call major label bands back when there were record labels. You know, the bands that made it, or well, almost bands like Gal Raver's band. 
And part of the reason I wanted to set Hold Me Down in this world in Clubland is obvious. Rock and roll is fun, to me at least. And I started my career as a music critic. And before that, I played in bands. I was one of those people for whom a certain set of clubs ser served as a third place, you know, not my home or my work. And as the years have gone by, I've certainly done that less and less, but music, live music, has remained important to me. In fact, one of the first things I did once I'd gotten vaccinated was go out to hear live music again. So part of my job as a writer was to successfully translate that to readers, maybe even to newcomers who've never stepped on those sticky floors or pilled a cocktail napkin to serve as makeshift earplugs, to share the fun of the rock and roll world, to invite newcomers in, much like some mysteries invite people to foreign places or long ago times. I mean, I guess you could say that with my hold enough, I wanted to make my own favorite club, The Rat, a leather clad version of Donna Leone's Venice. So I don't know if I succeeded, but I did know that I wanted to try. But I also wanna stress, and I think this is key for those of you who are writers to take note of, I said, hold me down in the rock world because that's how it came to me. It wasn't like I was saying, hmm, a library or a rock club? Or gee, I, I want something exotic. Uh, I know I'll make up someone semi-famous. Because especially for crime fiction writers, if we're not working on a series book, when these choices have already been made you know, a couple of books ago, this is how it happens or how I sh should stress it should happen. I do not think that anyone should try to set a book in the arts if the story doesn't come out of the setting. These environments, these miniature worlds aren't or shouldn't be merely window dressing. When we're writing from the bone, we don't choose our settings or our stories consciously often. They're organic, they're part of the story, the frame that lets us weave. Not that it's magic. When we write, we make choices constantly and each choice closes off another option. And I say this for any new writers out there and I wanna stress that yes, this process, the making of choices and the subsequent closing of doors continues to be one of the hardest parts of writing. And I say that this is my 29th mystery, it's still hard. And it's also why, perhaps this will be encouraging to some of you, the book in your mind is always gonna be so much better than what appears on the page. That's just the reality of writing and it doesn't get any easier. But sometimes we make these choices without realizing it. There are stories that draw us and settings that feel right to us even before we start to write. And often these are integrated into our stories in ways that we might not understand at first. And well, the rock world was right in that way for this book for Hold Me Down. Did it help that I knew this world intimately and over so many years that everything I use in my fiction has happened? Of course. But I guess I also have a t another take on that truism of write what you know. Because you, know, you can write something that's utter nonsense. I mean, my other series involves magical cats that can walk through walls and influence per human behavior. But if it feels true to you and you understand it, you understand the rules of that world, well, I guess that's one way of knowing it. But what matters more is that we write what feels hot to us, not in terms of trends or sales. I don't know if I could do that, maybe I would but in terms of emotional heat, resonance. Now, maybe this is a digression. Most of you know this, I'm sure, but in case there are some newbies in this group or even some folks who considered writing but haven't yet you know, gotten down to it yet. As a writer, you've got to be a heat seeker, a sensitivity seeker. It's the sore tooth syndrome. You've got what, 32 teeth in your mouth, more or less? Where does your tongue go to? To the sore one. Well, it's the same with the story. You gotta go where, where it hurts. Now, for me at least, rock and roll is not only fun, but it has that heat, that emotional heft. It's worth noting at this point that rock and roll has a thing about authenticity. The history of this from Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan up through the shags is a whole other topic for when you have a few more hours. But basically in rock, especially punk rock music with its do it yourself ethos, which is my milieu, um, in that world, the artist as songwriter is revered, in A plus ultra. At its heart, rock is not simply supposed to be about entertainment. It's supposed to be about tearing something out of yourself, creating something out of nothing and hoping that it sings. It's supposed to be about vulnerability paired with toughness, about bearing your soul to a beat, of course. Now that nighttime world is an environment I've used in my fiction before. My world enough, as I've said, is centered in the clubs but that book is from the point of view of a former music critic who, surprise, surprise, 
shared some of my feelings and memories and maybe some of my blind spots too. With Hold Me Down, I knew I wanted to go deeper into the scene, to explore that search for authenticity, to be a participant and not a critic or an observer, essentially to get as close as possible to that heat. But to do that, to make it mean for readers what it once meant for me, I had to do my research. Another thing that all us readers, all us writers have to be aware of. As I often like to write about, memory is faulty. So back when we could easily do this, I had a long lunch with a friend who was a certifiable rock star at one point and still lived to tell the tale. And I followed up with numerous conversations with other friends who were or are musicians, who worked the bars or booked those clubs I hung out in, who did the sound or covered the scene like I did. And those conversations gave me some gems, some color I might have otherwise forgotten. I mean, I was able to confirm much of what I remember and add detail. The, the look of the riser that serves as a stage from the, with the tape marks from the years of set lists, the smell of a microphone that hasn't been cleaned. But doing the work, as it often does, paid off in other ways as well. Talking to people who had been there, who had felt what I'd felt, also let me pick up some pieces that served to unlock bigger issues in the writing as well. For example, when one friend who used to sing in a local band mentioned how much she could see from on stage, it stuck with me, a tiny thing, a toss off. But when I found myself writing that detail in for Gal, that she was noticing how far back into the club, into the audience she could see, I realized how wonderful such an observational detail could be and how I could use it. Gal thinks she can see everything from on stage, just like my friend did. But as I wrote it, I was able to question whether what Gal was seeing was real or only, well, that I'll leave up to the reader. Details like this and the way it played out in Gal's perception confirmed that for me, the music scene is where the heat is, that there was something there that I wanted to bother, to poke at, that this was the way to give form to topics, to the conflicts that interest me. I shouldn't have been surprised. Music can still wake emotions in me that don't often surface, feelings that I don't have another voice for, and that is really where we write from. Once I was deeply into Hold Me Down, I realized that my, my manuscript was acting on me like music does, that this setting, this world, was allowing me to explore so many other things that mattered to me. In the person of a gal and her buddies, in those dark and drunken nights, I could explore issues of grief and trauma, memory and forgiveness. It was like I found myself in the music and the music returned the favor. So as far as setting a book in that world, well, you know, which came first, right? And so Hold Me Down comes out of my own history, both in terms of time spent in the music scene, those friendships and that nostalgia, but also more personal and recent connections, the emotions evoked by those songs, the resonance of those memories, both the good ones and the ones that have left their scars. Now, as to the writing itself, let me get back to the process, to the bright lights and the dark shadows. In a technical sense, setting a story in the music scene helped me with some of what I think of as a novel, novel's most troublesome bits, specifically exposition, backstory, and character development. Now, as I've said, the mystery at the center of Hold Me Down is a murder. I mean, that's what I do as a crime fiction writer. But even more to the point, I think that this crime is ultimately revealed to be an essential part of Gal's story. And that, but there's also a more personal mystery in the book as well. You see, when we, meet, when we first meet Gal, she's no longer touring. She's barely playing. But she's still a star at heart, swaggering and confident of her ability to hold the audience, to summon, as she sees it, the wild wet need of their eyes. But as my protagonist sifts through her memories trying to understand what happened and why, we flash back to the shy young songwriter Gal once was. And the comparison reveals that although the president, the present day Gal appears confident, one might say overconfident, she's blocked as a writer. The insecure young Gal pulled these great songs out of herself, including the title tune, Hold Me Down. The older one knows the tricks that turn a pop progression into an earworm but she's not writing, not anything good, anything authentic. So that means that along with the murder, there's a mystery of how that insecure but talented girl transformed into this older woman who's faced with a dead body and, and a friend who doesn't want to defend himself from murder charges, who doesn't know what to do to save her friend, but she's also stuck in other ways, unable to write as she did in her glory days, maybe unable to move on. It wasn't until I was well into several drafts that I realized that my setting, this world I love, would not only let me explore this character and her issues, it gave me the means to show the full range of her struggles to the reader. Because Gal's work, her love is her music, and that was a gold mine for me. 
And now this will be true for anyone who sets a book in the arts, I think. What I found was that Gal's creativity was crucial. It gave me a key to the writing of her because I not only had the current and former Gal's voice, her actions and her memories, I had the song she wrote, each of which is a product of, or at least shaped by, who Gal was at the time she composed them. And the songs aren't static, they're not time capsules. Once these songs are out there, they take on a life of their own, as creative works will do. People play them, they respond to them, they hear what they want to hear. Even Gal reacts to her own songs in different ways at different times. When Gal is in her fussy, anxious stage, for example, she's a careful composer, consciously adding a bridge to a song that she worries might be too simple. Later, when she's well in a less controlling or in control phase, she dismisses that bridge, breezing over it when she plays as a bit of pretentious fussiness. I mean, it's the kind of thing one does, revising as we go along. I'm sure as writers, we can all relate to this. But in terms of process, having this external bit of Gal gave me an opportunity to, to, an opportunity to illustrate not only Gal's changing state of mind over time, but also her changing take on her own work and by extension, who she was only a year or so before. And then of course, we have other people's reactions to Gal, her music and her songs, the suits at the record label, the fans, and ultimately her bandmates hear what Gal is producing in their own ways. And what they hear might be something very different from what Gal does or than what she intended to create at all. Now, obviously anyone writing about the arts or an artist can use the same process. I'm sure a painting or a film can serve the same expository role. In fact, at some point in the process, I also realized that I had another more current connection with the music scene, because in many ways, making music is really not that much different from what we do as writers. And yes, as you know, in my case, a crime writer, tenuous connection, you might say, well, it's actually a connection that goes deep. And one that I realized was crucial to the writing of this book. You've probably heard the line, writing about music is like writing, it's like dancing about architecture, right? Well, writing about music, especially writing about rock music, is also writing about writing. So in addition to all the angst and the issues, writing about writing is kind of wonderful. To be able to talk about the joy of creating as well as the frustration of being blocked, the dueling necessities of solitude and community, like we found at Crime Bay, it's all there. Only, you know, with the rock world, it's in a setting where everyone's wearing black leather and drinking cheap beer. And that was something I hadn't expected, that, un that unexpected joy. Now. What we hear and how we convey it as writers is gonna lead me into another digression. Because sometime after my music cr critic career, I went all into journalism and I ended up serving as an editor at an alternative weekly where I had a brilliant, crazy editor, sense of theme, who was an advocate of what we called at the time, the new journalism. If any of you are journalists or former journalists, you'll, you'll know um, the gold standard of journalism has traditionally been objectivity. You're supposed to let the facts define the story and you as the writer are supposed to stay out of it. But as Richard, my editor always stressed, this is impossible. In fact, trying to live up to the standard can get us into more trouble than not having standards at all. You start with what aboutism, and then you go downhill from there. The new journalism instead offered us some new rules. First, we had to accept that we are all subjective. We have at best an asymptotic relationship with objectivity. We are all biased. And when I say bias, I mean, we have an opinion, a point of view. We have our own take on a story or a situation on what we think is the reality at any given time. The new journalism told us that we have to acknowledge this. We have to own our subjectivity. Knowing that we are not and we cannot be objective, we must strive to be as aware of our biases as we can be. For we can only see things as we see them. That's who we are. Now, I believe this is sound advice for journalists. I know it is a gold mine for novelists, because if we as writers struggle to be aware of where we're coming from, of what our opinion or take on a story is, how much more so should our characters be struggling? They're plopped down into difficult or high pressure situations that they're merely hapless humans. They're normal folks for the most part who really have the time or the self-awareness to be, excuse me, to be aware of their biases. So how do they see the world? How can they get an unbiased take and how can we expect them to? These are all things that we use as writers. Now, I'm not saying that my gal gal is an unreliable narrator in the big dramatic gone girl or girl on a train sense. There's an art to that and it isn't mine. I'd prefer to focus on the everyday unreliability of flawed humans, the way wishful thinking and denial 
fear or the avoidance of pain may skew what we recall or how we view the past. But how do we show that? Well, I can tell you what I did. For me, there were the string of details, often perhaps contradictory, missed cues and misinterpretations. The bartender who looks at Gal, her most strung out and says, eat a sandwich, why don't you? When she's demanding a drink. And that's our cue that maybe she isn't quite as good looking or as healthy as she thinks. Then there are the, the random men or women who she's sure are lusting for her. You know, we have to sort of do a reality check. Maybe they're just being polite. Yes. Ultimately though, for me, the biggest touchstones were those songs. I had Gal's memories and her changing appreciation of them, her take on everyone she meets and the reactive responses of those around her. But I also got to use her compositions, which were loud and angry and ever so raw. These little pieces of herself, again, not as time capsules or not only, but as mirrors showing us and sometimes her bandmates and a few others, facets of herself, of what she was going through, whether or not she was aware of it at the time. Because we're talking process, I'll confess, I also very much enjoyed being able to use the setting to move the story along because rock and roll is after all, all about the beat. Being on tour with a band is a bit of a pressure cooker. You're in close confines with the same people every day. People who often have wildly, you often have wildly passionate connections with. And also some people who may not have your best interests at heart. And on top of that, as close as you are packed in a van or a backstage closet that's passing for a dressing room, you're also rootless and disconnected, separated from anything like a normal routine or a normal life. Then you throw in the situations that are almost expected to get a little crazy, the promotional stops, radio stations, the backstage hijinks, with a crazy craziness that is to some extent encouraged by an industry that cares more about image than the artists who make it ha all possible. And add in the drugs and yes, all the various substances that you are used and abused in the book are taken from life. And you have a kind of accelerator Whatever is gonna happen will happen sooner when you're on the road and it's gonna be loud. So that's how writing about fame and its dark side helped me in terms of process. The songs, the reception of those songs by the audience, by Gal's bandmates, by Gal herself, life on the road and in the clubs, the late nights and the wild parties. All of these not only served the plot, they opened the way for character development and perhaps more crucial to me for exposition and backstory, giving those potential dead spots life. And they certainly helped me move things along. And again, in terms of how I write, and as a word to the rise to the wise, to the newer writers out there, these were discoveries I made after the fact, during revisions or draft three or five or eight. I don't think you can start writing, okay, this setting is gonna allow me shortcuts to backstory or motive, <laughs> or really, I don't think you should write that way because that's mechanical and mechanical things have no heart. Mechanical writing has no heat. But when you find yourself in this world and you find these tools at hand, well, I was overjoyed to be able to use them. Overjoyed to be revisiting this world I once knew and loved. And ultimately also overjoyed to realize during the writing that this setting, Clubland, would let me explore so many larger topics. For example, in Gal's struggle, I saw the tension between performing and creating, a tension familiar to many of us as authors. I mean, on the most basic level, I'm thrilled to be here talking with you today, but the time I spent thinking about what I was going to say is time I didn't spend working on my next book. I also saw the struggle to make sense of the world, to uncover and reject what is false, and that includes any false sense of objectivity, to inoculate ourselves against the dangers of the not true, even as remembering of the past hobbles us. I saw the striving to dig down and find something real. Because just as Gal is trying to understand the murder of her colleague, the truth of the situation, she is also struggling with who she is, with her art, as she attempts to write a real song, another Hold Me Down, another hit that will ring with, yes, authenticity once again. Authenticity, which we can also read as truth. As we all know, truth is usually the payoff in crime fiction, the whodunit or the why done it of a mystery for sure. But it's also the key, <laughs> wow, uh, Siri just opened up. But truth, oh, turn that off. No, there we go. Truth is also the key to our characters. Beyond the simple motives of money or lust, truth is what makes our characters live, the reason they become real for us. It may be the reason we write as well, exploring that sore tooth again, the world. We are looking for the rotten spot, the vulnerable spot, the truth. And of course, a big part of Gal's truth, my truth, 
is mixed in with the music world and with all those memories as well. In particular, the way in which nostalgia or love, pain or fear can warp our recollection of the past, past encapsulated in Gal's song, in all our early, earlier work, and in my own experience of this dark and insular world. Finally, perhaps ultimately, writing about this world brought all these elements together for me. It let me explore once again the many ways in which humans love and damage each other, how they move on or don't. And I mean, that's what we always write about, isn't it? Fame and those bright stage lights only makes everything larger. Thanks. Thank you, Clea. Excellent, excellent. With a cameo um, by Siri. <laughs> we love showing people a world they may not be familiar with. And I think your book is definitely going to do this. Something which is has a mystique, an attractiveness. And yet we we see the dark side of it. The musicians which have passed away because of uh, bad behavior, bad choices, uh, terrible decisions. I think you follow in the footsteps of one of the greatest uh, uh, rock and roll novel showing the dark side is Spider Kiss by Harlan Ellison, mm -hmm. who is Thank primarily you. known as a speculative fiction writer, uh, maybe on the science fiction uh, side, but when he writes, wrote Spider Kiss, it really showed that dark side of what the fame and the rock and roll can absolutely do to a person. And I, I can't wait to read your book and, and see that. Uh, another great uh, music novel is The Big Rewind by Libby Cudmore, which explores how music makes you feel and how that defines various points of our life. And as you say, your, your experience was, was at a younger time and you were an entirely different person then. And so the music meant something, but people still remember, 40 years later, they remember how that song made them feel. And they still have that passionate, connection with it and the great thing now is that i see writing now is very much like the indie music scene of the 90s you be when back then before then you you had to make it by signing with a major label that was the only way to make it and you signed away all your rights you got nothing for it and you usually imploded after you know maybe an album or two and then the indie music scene came the tools came into being where people could make their own music, get their own voices heard, find their own audience, no matter how alternative they were. They didn't have to be commercial for radio anymore. And now writers are able to do the same thing. There's a great parallel there. And it's a wonderful way to open up and let more writers like now uh, get their voices heard and find their audience. This is true. Oh. And Dale, if I can just throw out some other great music books. Um, uh, Walter Mosley, the crime fiction writer, has a fantastic book about a blues man. It's, it's not a crime fiction novel. It's called R.L.'s Dream. Uh, mm. That's a wonderful book. Um, uh, Pagan Kennedy has a book, The Exes, about a band all made up of, of uh, it's, it's two couples that are broken up. Um, and it's, it's very funny. It's very, it's very touching. And of course, you even have... Um, I'm blanking on his name, The Commitments, uh, uh, Roddy Doyle's The Commitments. Right, right, and, and Nick Hornby. Really, yeah, Hornby. Yeah, and, and Nick Hornby, and, and, but Roddy Doyle really gets the dynamics of, you know, when this, you, you start off with the best intentions and what happens when you've been playing together for a while. So yeah, there, there are a lot of good books out there. And uh, Marie has a question. Uh, what sure. music is Gal's music? What kind of rock and roll? Um, She's uh, she comes out of the punk scene, but I would say it's more sort of a uh, power pop uh, garage type, um, you know, arena rock. Riot That's Girls, maybe something. Uh, that. She she slightly predates the Riot Girls, but yeah, I, it's funny. I just did a piece for uh, Crime Spree magazine on five songs that Gal Raver wished she'd written, and I uh. did choose bands like L Seven and Slater Kinney, um, yeah. and uh, 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 Deep Valley is a, a newer band. Uh, but yes, it, that's just sort of, you know, post-punk loud rock and roll. Excellent. And I love the energy of that. I mean, a, a few people get together in a garage and they put something out, they pour their heart and their soul into it. And it's loud. It may not be really good, but it's it's really emotional. And it it's catches authentic. fire. And I love listening to bands like that. And again, I love writing like that too. That's a, that's a little rough around the edges. It's not perfectly polished. It's not for everybody, but man, it touches a chord within you. Mm. Okay. Dean's got a question. How do you create a scene and immerse your reader in a moment? He's currently writing a noir grunge where vigilante story. 
and he loves modern westerns like Cormac McCarthy, and he also loves grunge rock. So how do you create the scene and put your reader in that scene? It's hard, Dean. That's the question that, you know, I'm still asking myself, you know, working on my 30th mystery. Um, you get the detail, you try to get the sensory detail. For me, it was, you know, and this is one of the reasons that I went back and I talked to so many people. Um, it was remembering not just the music and you play the music and, you know, you try to capture the emotion that, you know, wells up in you, but also, you know, remembering what the sticky floors felt like, uh, remembering the smells. Um, I mean, I remember when smoking was banned in the clubs and suddenly it's like, oh, you know, the, the, I was used to waking up in the morning and having my clothes be all smoky. But then once that was gone, it was like, wow, stale beer and vomit. That's what it smells like. Um, and, you know, the, the feel even of the air. Um, what's it like to be, you know, I remember running from the, you know, from the tea in Kenmore Square to the Rat in freezing weather, but only wearing my black leather jacket, partly because I knew I was going to be, you know, packed in there and it was going to be sweaty and hot. And partly, you know, because I just wanted to look cool wearing the black leather jacket. Um, so try to evoke, do anything you can to revive those uh, sensory experiences for yourself. And then working on describing them, that's, that's, that's what we keep working at. That's, you know, that's the, the goal. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd start with the research and I, I try to think about all the senses, uh, what everything smells like, what something tastes like, what the air feels like what the floor feels like when you're walking across it. And you mentioned how from the stage, she can see up to a certain level and think she can see all. Yeah. And yet there may be things hidden to her. Yeah. Or maybe she's seeing something that, you know, if you see a flash of something in the dark, maybe your, you know, your interpretation might not necessarily be accurate. Right. Uh, question for Marie, are you on Audible? Is this out on audio yet? Um, it is not yet. Um, my publisher is working on it. I hope it will be soon. Excellent. And uh, from Jill, who says, your, your summary of your book was clear and concise and hooked you right into the story. Thank you. So do you have advice for everyone else about writing a synopsis since you can do it so well? <sighs> Thank you. They're so miserable. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the Everybody hates thing. doing it. Everybody yeah. hates doing it. Well, the key is if you could write it in a, in a paragraph, then you wouldn't need you know, 80,000 words to write it, right? You know, right. so I, I think the, I think it, um, what's key is to just think about your, your protagonist and what the central conflict is and how that conflict comes about. Um, and that can help, you know, and, and then just keep winnowing it down. The other thing, and this is true, I think for all writing, it helps to write and put something away, you know, for a day or two and look at it again. And then like, when you look at it, you can go, oh, th this, this sentence doesn't make sense and I can cut out those two. Um, but other than that, just think about, try to think of what your central conflict is. Okay. Who your protagonist Marie, Marie is. Marie just called me a liar. She says she loves to write synopses. So Bob wants to know how long are your chapters and how long is your book? I think you said about 80,000 is the norm. Yeah. And how long do you write as a chapter? And each, how do you break that down? Uh, my chapters are short. And I don't know. I just, they just seem to break naturally. Um, in this book, there is a lot of back and forth in time. Um, and it, I just think of a chapter as a scene. And my chapters tend to just be a couple of pages. Okay, so you're writing modern day flashback, modern day flashback kind of thing? Not, not entirely, but often. You know, maybe it's more like, you know, that night, the next morning, flashback. Okay. Uh, Michael wants to know, um, how do you incorporate the real world? Like uh, putting, is it the real rat scaler or is just the place that uses those real places as a jumping off point? Um, I, I used fictional places partly because, you know, you don't want to, you That's don't want someone to say what there wasn't, you know, there wasn't actually a murder there. Um, right. But there, there are some places that are recognizable. They're sort of just the, the, the side. But I, I use real details. Um, yeah. You know, I use you know, the backstage at the Rat, which was a little room off to the side um, that was just covered in graffiti and, you know, had and smelled because it was airless. <laughs> um, and I use like the practice space that of the band that one of the bands that I was in, which was a, you know, a basement that we shared with another band. And you know, no one's supposed to bring food down, but you knew somebody was bringing food down because there were roaches and rats and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I give things different names. Um, and, and you know, I was able to visualize them and often I would, I would use um, real settings or I'd mix and match something like I'd, I think, okay, this is a Thayer Street loft, but I'm putting it on um, you know, next door to the channel. Hmm. 
I love the movie about CBGBs. I mean, it was a fictionalized account of what yeah. actually went down, but boy, did that give the flavor. Yeah. And when the bikers come in and say, clean up your bathroom, I mean, wow, you can just That's imagine. Bad. Nobody yeah. ever goes in there. It's so bad. Oh, yeah. But it really gave the flavor of what it was like. I mean, all the insane craziness went on there. And it's just like you're booking a band. And then a year later, they're suddenly at the top of the charts. I mean, they just get their start there and then they go on. And then again, they may implode or they just may superstar them. Yeah. It's just crazy. Yeah. Or they may be become superstars. I'm thinking of bands I saw at CBs. You know, they be, may become superstars and then... You know, yeah, Blondie, Johnny, I mean, and then and then or 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 just you know, self destruct. I'm thinking Johnny Thunders. I saw him there, and he was yeah. I, while he was basically nodding out on stage. It was, you know, wonderful and sad at the same time. Oh, Bob would like to know how many drafts do you do, and do you have a limit? <laughs> wow, uh, I don't, and I'm I am what you know. I assume you guys are familiar with this term. I'm a I'm a pantser. Um, um, I. I write only a f as far ahead as I can see. I mean, I sort of have a basic idea, but I do not plot. But because I don't plot, I have to do a lot of revisions. Um, so I don't, I don't know how many I do. I do it until, un until it's, you know, until it reads right. Um, and I mean, even to the point where after I turned this into my editor, I would read something, and go, you know, and, and, and rework it. So yeah, you just revise as often as you have, you can until, until you can put it aside for you know, a couple of weeks and read it through and like it all. I guess that's the key. Okay. Joseph would like to know what's your advice on time management? Because I know how many books you write and how valued your time is. And we appreciate your spending your time to come talk to us. Grateful to be here. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here and, and thanks. And this is fun. Um, I, I laugh about time management because we've learned uh, my husband and I have learned the hard way that I need to, to have a timer with me because I'll often do something like say, I just want to work for another half hour on something. <laughs> I've, I've started the artichokes, you know, and then I'll hear them running down the stairs, you know, and the smell of smoke will get. And to the me. smoke alarms going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've learned it's like, if I do that, which, you know, I still do, I, I set the timer, you know. Um, but other than that, I write, um, my process is that when I'm, actively writing right now i'm sort of in a lull between I have something drafted we'll see where it goes um i i write uh i go by words per day um and often that's that's anywhere from a thousand to you know 1500 usually a day which is doable um and um you know and, and i do it until i hit it and for me i still do a lot of uh of either uh, journalism or writing for hire. I do a lot of work for Harvard, still bless them, they pay the bills. Um, and I do a lot of copy editing. And um, so I, I tend to need to get that done first because otherwise it's nagging at me. Right. Um, so I'll get that done first. And then at three or four o'clock, I'll come up here and, um, you know, and then it's like, I, I can't come down, you know, and at some point John will stick his head in and say, you know, should I start dinner? You know, and <laughs> should I call out? <laughs> should I call out? Yeah. What pizza? <laughs> okay, since the book is so immersed in the music world, we have to ask, give us three to five or your favorite bands that still move you, still matter, and still what have what you think is that that level of musicianship or that level of emotion or that level of staying power? Um, I'll give you some, that's a great question. Thank you, Dale. Um, I'll give you some oldies and some, some newbies. Um, L7, I've, I've, I don't think they're still active but man I can listen to an old L7 song and they, they really get me and I'm, I'm focusing on women-centered bands for this um Slater Kinney I have loved for the 20 years they've been around they came out of the the Northwest uh Riot Girl scene and they're just wonderful and they do songs that just knock me out um newer bands I've discovered one called Deep Valley and it's D-E-A-P-V-A-L-L-Y uh -huh. um so they're like in their 20s and they have this, they have, I heard a song on the radio called Smile More, which any woman out there will, you know, relate to. Oh, it's yeah. Like, yeah. And, but everything they do is great. And it's, it's, it's actually, it's a duo I discovered. And yeah. um, they're just, they're just wonderful. They're just wonderful. Um, and they're sort of sardonic and, and, you know, melodic at the same time. Um, I also like a lot of, uh, well, in terms of power pop, it's sort of punk meets 
meets uh, pop, um, uh, the darts. I think they're the darts oh. US. There must be a British dart, uh, darts. They're, they're pretty great. Um, you know, I, I love I love Robin. I love, uh, you know, a lot of Rihanna. Um, have you heard the regrets? Hey, I have not heard the regrets. Oh, oh, I them? oh, God. I okay. love them. I just discovered them. And wow, talk about power pop mixed with a little bit, you know, that, that girl power stuff. Mm -hmm. They're awesome. And I love them. And I started listening and like song after song after song. And I'm like, totally hooked. Totally awesome. hooked. The regrets. The regrets. I will look for them. And uh, we do have, besides you and myself, we have a few other people. Uh, Molly. We also have um, Avram, who were also at Crime Bank. And I think both of them were for the first time. And I would really love to hear their impressions of what their first writer conference, even though it was a mystery conference, what their writer conference was like of meeting the authors, uh, getting information, being able to ask their questions of people like yourself and just one-on-one -on -one being able to find so much in such a short time. So Avram, Mali, uh, feel free to chime in here. Let's see. Uh, Dale, if, if you want, uh, they can unmute, but uh, the uh, camera is gonna be stay the camera will stay focused on Clea. So yeah, that's fine. Alvaro Mamali, if you if you want to chime in there, please feel free. Sure. I, I have to say the best part was was especially after the COVID shutdown and partial shutdown, getting getting to be with people was was fabulous. But um, spending time with people who care about words and books, um, who speak the same language, basically was was wonderful um meeting people like sarah who's i think on this she is and I sarah think. yes <laughs> yeah um who i've i've heard before um was was really a blast so uh not not to mention learning about uh not not drinking uh green drinks because they might contain uh poison poison yeah <laughs> So, yes. so there was don't drink the Midori sour. No Midori sours. <laughs> Your kidneys will shut down. It's all over. Um, so there was substantive information, but um, making making like minded friends and just the conversations were were the best. Excellent, Avram. How about you? Um, I I came in with pretty high expectations, and they were completely exceeded on every level. I just I thought that um, uh, people were just so unbelievably nice um, and people were so kind of egalitarian. I just thought um, everybody was made to feel welcome. Uh, I was certainly made to feel welcome regardless of where people were on their path. Um, and as, as a veteran of, of other artistic communities, um, I know that, that that doesn't always happen. Um, it certainly didn't always happen in rock and roll. Um, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> I also uh, I, I, it was uh, it was a great honor to uh, to meet Dale in person because we had worked uh, online quite a bit. Uh, Dale's been mentoring me, um, and um, I had no idea that uh, how how much the uh, the digital format really is only showing us the tip of the Dale T. Phillips uh, iceberg. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I pay him extra, folks. <laughs> hey, if if I can jump in, uh, Dean Parsons, are you still there? Because yeah. you asked about the Who, oh yeah, I, I the Who, uh, the Stones, the Beatles, um, yeah, I just I wanted to focus on on um, uh, on women centered bands just right. uh, because of the but yeah yeah, yeah. the iconic all, all bands are the iconic bands. I mean yeah. you know they they are what they are and you can't ever ignore yeah. them in a conversation. But I like to see who's outside of that. Who's yeah who should we be hearing about? And somebody else mentioned uh, Hailstorm. Carrie mentioned Hailstorm. Great female yeah, from Hailstorm. Demand. Yeah. Oh, Joan Jett. My God. I, oh God, um, Joan Jett's the queen. Yeah. The queen. Yeah. And Hart. I mean, you Old know, school. also and yeah. Nancy Wilson. It's like, you know, talk about blistering. Oh. Yeah. No, uh, I want to because great music, and I think it's it's important too into some of my work. Now, Sarah writes historicals, and I wonder, Sarah, do you ever use any kind of music as a backdrop or as a reminder of what the past was uh, with that era of a particular music. You're, You're muted, Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> Oops, I, I always sorry. love that. Oops. I always do that. You're unmute. Um, yeah, because one of my major characters is a pianist. 
and I will find recordings of contemporary pianists and, as well as contemporary music and play them while I'm writing to, to get the sense of, of what she thinks and what she feels and the same way I imagine, Clea, you use, well, I know you because you, you took me around the New Orleans jazz scene. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, we got to hear some well talk about female centered female fronted bands we went to see tuba skinny who do uh skinny, the, the yes. early jazz of the mm, you know pre certainly pre-1930s uh and they're fronted by um oh, what is her name shea cone who's a uh, songwriter and cornetist who's just amazing brilliant and now clea I, i'm sure you get this question a lot people always ask What's your favorite book of all the ones you've written? And, you know, it may be the most current, but I'm always like, that's like asking who your favorite child is. You know, do you pick one over the others? I mean. Well, it's it's sort of difficult for me because I also write the cozies. Exactly. And the cozies yeah. are, you know, are very familiar and I love them. And the, the latest is, you know, a, a cat on the case, which I think you can see on my bookshelf. Um, and I mean, I, I love those books and they are like coming home and they're fun. Um, and they're they're warm and fuzzy, um, but yeah. Otherwise, it's this book. I mean, this is the this is the book of my heart. It touches on a lot of issues that were very important to me, um, and it uh, brought up it brought up a world that mattered a lot to me. I don't know if I will revisit this world. I feel like I might have have done you've it. Done it. You've it. you've said what yeah. you wanted to say about it. Yeah, and and this book was in the works for actually a couple of years, and yeah. um, and that really meant that I did get to do I get to revise it thoroughly. I don't know, Dale, if you have this experience or Sarah or any of the other writers out there. Often, once I've written something, like I talked about how Gal, when she plays a song, she'll she'll go, oh, no, I don't like that bit. And she'll just go over it. Often when I'm doing a reading or an event like that, I'll think, oh, this is that's that sentence I should have changed. Thus mm -hmm. far with Hold Me Down, I, I like everything about it. So I think it's that's my best. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Marie has a question. <laughs> this is going to be a tough one here. Sure. What is your next book in terms of theme and elements of world building? Well, I had the book that I have drafted, and I don't know if it'll be my next book, but it's the next thing that I've been working on, um, is a, a he said, she said. Um, and it is set also in the art world, but it's set sort of in the, um, well, the, 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 she, the she in it, the, uh, the, the female point of view is, um, she's a painter, she's a visual artist, uh, she lives in an artist co-op uh, that's sort of modeled after places like Brick Bottom, except I put it on the Fenway um, in Boston. Um, and but that book actually came out of came out of two experiences, very different ones. Uh, one, a friend of mine um, who was recently lost his wife; she's widowed. Um, she she was. Um, she was a little out of control and, um, and that contributed to her untimely death. Um, and as part of his grieving and his healing, he wrote a, a sort of a, an open letter to her, um, I'm changing her name, just in case any of you know him, but um, it, he called it the, you know, the, the fuck you uh, Ginny uh, letter. And he, a bunch of us got to read it. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking about the dynamics of their relationship and, and it ended with, you know, and fuck you for dying because I loved you so much. Um, I was thinking about that and I was thinking about the dynamics of my own parents' relationship and, you know, they were more or less happily married and they stayed married till the end of both their lives. But, um, but I was just thinking of the way couples see things differently and uh, just the different dynamics that come into play, especially there are a lot of issues um, in, in the, there, there are a lot of gender expectations and gender roles that often play into the arts world um, in which um, to be, to pick one, just one part of it out, out. A lot of men seem to slightly fetishize the idea of the woman artist. Um, and you know, there, this plays in both ways, but, but that just, it seemed like that was an interesting relationship there. And so that, became the core for this manuscript that I've now finished and I've put aside and I don't know if it'll be my next book or if it's trash, but that's uh, what I was was working on. And it's just, 
it's it's the difference in perception and difference in expectations um, when we come together. Um, you know, we, we are always different, but especially when we come together from different worlds. I mean, any individual is, any two individuals are different, but specifically when they come together from different worlds. Uh, so what do they see? What do they think is real? Hmm. Okay, Marie's got more questions for you. What did you feel the theme was for Hold Me Down? And then have you ever lived, have you lived in Boston most of your life? I know um, that's not where you were born, so. No, I was, I was uh, I'm a suburban New Yorker. Uh, originally, I came up here to go to college, and I stayed. Uh, so I have now lived up here for most of my life. Um, uh, th themes are, um, it seems like, I didn't realize this until recently, but it seems like the themes in a lot of my my ser more serious books, the non-cozies, um, are the unreliability of memory um, mm -hmm. and how we uh, alter, how how so many elements alter our perception of, of what is what is real. So I guess it's, it's perception. You know, and, okay. and also uh, it, important to Gal, I realized is that she, her friends are her family, it's family of choice. She feels herself fiercely loyal to her friends. I and mean, that's why she ends up defending Amy's widower, Walter. Um, and, and she loves her friends. But at the same time, she's been so damaged at various points that she has done perhaps irreparable damage to her friends too. And she has to come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. um, Avram wants to know uh, your particular method of pantsing as a kind of linear, if he understands you. Is, is your pantsing linear or do you just bounce all over the place with it? I, I am linear. I write a story from beginning to end. Um, you know, the first draft, which, you know, might be clutter shit and it might go off the rails at various times. But that's um, very linear. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's how I work. Uh, how about scheduling? Uh, would you, you said you have a um, word count that you try to hit. Do you have a set? It, does it take like an hour and you're done? Do you knock off <laughs> or do you say, oh, it's, I've got to grind this out today and it's five hours or. Yeah, I grind it out. I mean, there are very few days. I, and this is the advantage, I guess, of having been a journalist is I always meet deadline. And mm -hmm. even if it's a self-imposed deadline. So it's like, if it's, you know, even if it's just a thousand words and I'm stuck at 893, you know, I'll, I won't leave until I get that other, you know, 107, you know, even mm -hmm. if the 107 are all dialogue of, well, that looks interesting. He said in a, you know, in a furious tone to add, you know, for, <laughs> you he's know, pulled I mean, his pistol, blam, 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 yeah. blam, blam. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you, you need to have something on the paper in order to revise it. And right. also I, I do believe that, you know, the, you let the rusty water flow and the, and the clear water follows. Um, so yeah, you, you just have to do it. So I, I'm miserable with time management and scheduling, but mm. I, but I am loyal to my deadline. Good to hear. And that's encouraging. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice do you have for our group? Uh, aspiring writers uh, want to be persistent writers who want to publish no matter what they do. What advice can you give them? Keep at it, you know, apply, but to seat. Um, I like to quote Nick Lowe, the pub rocker, the guy behind, uh, um, I'm blocking on his band, but anyway, Nick Lowe, he said, bash it out now, tart it up later. Love it. I'm, just, I am so it. stealing that. <laughs> well, credit Nick. Oh, <laughs> Rock totally. Pile, that was his band, Rock Pile. Wow, that's great. How about uh, craft? Uh, would you recommend any particular books on craft, any particular writers that they should be reading as far as following that? Um, I, I am not really familiar with many. I, I used to teach writing years ago. Um, and, you know, I, I think I used Bird by Bird, which was a lovely book. Annie but Lamont, basically, yeah. Annie Lamont, yeah. Um, basically, read widely and wildly. You know, don't just read your own stuff. Don't just read your own genre, read everything and, you know, read for fun. Sure. But also try to read like a writer, you know, how did somebody do that? Um, and, and just, you know, learn from everybody. Yeah. I always say that it's just like, we are magicians, but the great thing is, is you can learn from the greatest magicians that we have because they show you the act. They show you every step of the act. If you look at their work, you break it down scene by scene, uh, sentence by sentence, character, theme, everything. It's right there. 
Yeah. I mean, The Great Gatsby is deceptively simple, but so complex. And there's so many layers. And that may be beyond you, but you can learn from some of the other works and just grind your way through. Like you said, is just absorb, absorb. And the wider you read, the more you get. Yeah, like in this this latest thing, the you know the, the manuscript that may or may not see light. Um, I realized I've re- I've read a lot of Valerie Martin, and she writes these short, really bitter novels. Um, mm. And you know, and it, you you think that you won't care about these characters, but you know you read them and you do. Um, and it's like, well, you know, what did what did she do? How did she? And you, you don't have to like them, but you know, you, you do. They're readable. Um, you know, and, and try to read, you know, try to read new people to try to read, um, oh, uh, what's her name? Um, Milk Fed is her latest, uh, Melissa Broder. Um, she had a, I think her wildest best novel is called um, The Pisces. Uh, and um, it's, it's just bizarre and it's beautiful. And it starts off being sort of merman erotica and it ends up being a, a meditation on the void and death. Oh, boy. Uh, so, I, okay, I'm all over that. And what was yeah. the name? Uh, uh, the, Pisces. Broder. Mr. the Pisces, Melissa Broder, the Pisces. Or uh, I mean, I'm a huge Hillary Mantel fan. Um, yeah. You know, if you're in the mood for a, you know a, a six to nine hundred word historical, oh my God, does she and talk about character development? She inhabits these people, and it's just it's just wonderful writing. Um, so yeah, Melissa Broder, Hillary Mantel, Valerie Martin. Um, I'm just looking over at my Thank bookshelf. You. Um, I know, yeah. yeah. No cheating. Uh, no cheating. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, now I'm looking over what I'm seeing is is uh, Henry Fielding and Tolstoy uh, so, oh, well, and the okay. Mahabharata. Yeah, so yeah. Let's just so, go right there. The trouble is <laughs> that's what's on the shelf right over there. Sorry. Is they write such a different style that many readers today aren't used to that. They haven't properly met them, and it's very difficult for them to get into it because they're so used to the a breezier, uh, more modern style. And the painstaking detail, the setting that Tolstoy and James yeah. go through is just like most people don't have the patience for it nowadays. Read Anthony Trollope then. He's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. And he wrote 50. He wrote in the morning before his job at the post office. Yeah. And he wrote. And if he finished one book and he still had five minutes to go, he got a new piece of paper and started the next book. So, yeah. folks, there's no excuses. Yeah. Uh, Marie, who also was a journalist, and that's why she's asking so many questions. Uh, she says, what do you find easier to write, fiction or nonfiction? Um, well, these days I find nonfiction easier to write because I do it because I do it for the money uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's short form. Um, but I, I wouldn't I, I'm just not interested in writing. I have three nonfiction books in print um, and I'm just not interested in doing uh, long form nonfiction at this point. Um, Unless so, somebody asked you to write a, a book on music. Yeah, I don't even, I don't think I would commit to a book at this point. Wow. wow. Yeah, I, I like writing short pieces. I mean, I've, you know, I have, I have an op-ed coming out, I think this week in the Globe that came out of Hold Me Down, which is me talking about my themes. Um, mm. And uh, a Crime Spree again, just put up a piece where I talk about, you know, which crime inspired me because I realized Lisa Unger um, wrote a, a, an interesting piece about how she was inspired to write crime, she thinks, because when she was a child, there was a murder in her community. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, oh, well, there was a murder in my community too. In fact, it was my, my childhood best friend's oldest sister was, was raped and murdered. Oh, and, God. you know, I went to high school with a serial killer. I mean, this is true. And, you know, I was thinking, so which crime is it that inspired me to go into crime fiction? And there were several others. So, um, so I wrote about that. So that's, you know, that's nonfiction, but that's, uh, that's first person, that's just essay writing. So, yeah. yeah, but wow. I mean, you know, Stephen King, you know, they, people always want to know where do you come up with that kind of things? Carrie wants to know which serial killer because there are so many. Joel Rifkin. Oh, I've heard he killed that. he's he killed sex workers on Long Island. He lived a, about a block and a half away from me. In oh. fact, he installed the car stereo in my mom's car. And um, yeah, we, we served together on our high school newspaper. He was the photographer. <laughs> And, and he I was went good and he went bad. Oh, well, boy. I was working at the Globe on the night desk, which is, you know, breaking news um, when he was arrested. And this was back in the days before the Internet. So you you would request you get a notice that like a, a wire story was coming in and you could you could request the photo and the photo would slowly, slowly print out about this dot yeah, line by here. line. Yeah, line by line. And so I was like waiting at the printer for my thing to, to come. I don't know. You know, it was probably a I don't know, a shooting and 
denim or something, but I was sitting there waiting for it. And I see this thing start to go, eh, 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 and I look over, it's like, oh, it's not mine. It's like, then I see Dateline, East Meadow, New York. Now, nothing ever happens in East Meadow, New York. <laughs> so I'm pulling on it, which you're not supposed to do because you can rip it, I'm pulling on it, I'm pulling on it. And it was like, you know, Joel Rifkin arrested, you know, remains of, of you know, murder victim in trunk. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's spooky when it's somebody you you know and have actually worked with. That's just terrifying. And you always go, what if? Well, I, I'm not a serial killer, so I don't go what if. But yeah. <laughs> no, but no, I mean, what if I had been their next victim? I mean, what if, yeah. you know, they've had a bad day? It's like, could I have seen any of the signs? I mean, kind of things. To me, that's a story prompt. In fact, now I'm going to write a book called What If? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is a great story prompt. Yeah. Well, I will, I will do uh, one plug for me before I, we, we finish off here, because people should know Killer Nashville Magazine uh, is a wonderful magazine for the Killer Nashville Conference. And they just came out with their third uh, new release of their Revive Magazine. And I have an article in there along with an interview with Lee Child. So mm. I'm in very good company. And that just came out last Friday. And it's absolutely free to read Killer Nashville Magazine. And uh, Cleo, we just want to thank you because this is so good to get a professional like yourself to come in and help uh, everybody who has all these questions and would like to know the magic of how to write, how to, how to get your work out there, what themes you should put in, what you should write, when you should write, how to write, uh, how fast, how slow, how much. And uh, we get so much from an author like yourself who's just proven over and over that it can be done. Just sit down, get the butt in the chair, get an idea, and just keep going at it. Follow the heat. Follow the heat. That is yeah. that is words to live by. Yeah. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been quite wonderful. And we'll turn it over to Robert now.